Living Fiction. Northwestern University, in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company, brings you a radio dramatization of a timeless story, Per Gorio by Honoré de Balzac. Another in a series of living fiction. We are in the Maison Vauquer, a third-class boarding house on the left bank of the Seine in Paris. It is the breakfast hour, and around the meanly set table sit a group of people who are alike only in that they are hungry and that they detest one another. Monsieur Gorio. Yes, Madame Vaquet. Why do you always smell the bread before you taste it? I smell the bread, Madame, so that I can tell of what flour it is made. You forget Papa Gorio was once a flour merchant. Oh, that is true, isn't it, Monsieur de Rastignac? Well, take your nose off the bread, old fellow. You'll get a corn on it. <coughs> oh, you've knocked his face right into his soup, Monsieur Vautrin. Was that necessary, Vautrin? He's tripping. You are a disagreeable fellow, sir. If you take any liberties with What'll me... What'll happen, old chap? Well, you shall pay for it someday. Down below, eh? Down where the naughty boys go. Excuse me. I am not hungry. Now, you see what you've done, Vautrin? He's gone and without his breakfast, too. Oh, the devil take him, Rostignac. The world would be a pleasanter place without the old fool. Yes, indeed, when a man can't pay his rent. You wouldn't say that if you knew what I know. Oh, what do you know? Mr. Gorio is the father of a comtesse. What? Oh. What's that? I knew it all the time, the Rostinier. And what's more, he has another daughter who is a baroness. But where did you learn it? I called upon the comtesse yesterday, Vautrin, if you must know. Ah, you have been stepping into the world of luxury again, Rostinier. That's quite a venture for a penniless law student. It will take money, my boy, if you intend to jump from this hovel to the boulevard Saint-Germain. This is no hovel, Monsieur Vautrin. Pigsty, then. Monsieur Vautrin. But how did you happen to call on old Goriot's fine daughter yesterday, Rastignac? Why, I had a card of introduction from my cousin, the Vicomtesse du Bosson. Ah, surely the daughter didn't volunteer the information that old Goriot was her father? No. No, I discovered it quite by accident. Tell us about it. Well, you must know it happened this way. You will wait here in the hall, monsieur. Madame la Comtesse is engaged for the moment. Thank you. Goodbye, my dear. Hurry, father. I hear my husband coming down the front stairs. Yes, now. yes, I'll go out the back way. I can find it. Hurry, then. Goodbye. Good Lord, old Gorio. Yes? How do you do? Oh, oh, you are Monsieur Eugene de Rostignac? Yes, madame. The cousin of the Vicomtesse de Beausson. Come in, please. This way. I'm very glad to see you. Please, sit down. Thank you, madame. I'm afraid the dear Vicomtesse quite forgot me when she entertained last week. You must help her to recover her memory. And now that you're here, why... Oh, I see. Did I hear that old beggar? Oh, uh, Excuse me. My dear, here is Monsieur de Rastignac. It is de, isn't it? Yes. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, of course. Monsieur de what? He is a cousin to the Vicomtesse de Bosson. Oh, really? Well, will you have a glass of wine, monsieur? Oh, no, thank you. I call merely to pay my respects. The Vicomtesse de Bosson. I'm delighted to find that we have acquaintances in common. More than you think, perhaps. Why, what do you mean, Monsieur de Rostignac? Why, only just now I saw a gentleman go out the door. Oh, Gorio, my next-door neighbor in the house where I'm lodging. Oh. oh. I hope I haven't said anything wrong. Oh, why, uh, of course not. Uh, uh, you might have called him Monsieur Gorio. You could not know anyone who is dearer to us both. No, indeed. As a matter of fact, Monsieur Gorio is Madame's father. Uh, He's a rather painful... Her father? There is nothing strange in Madame having a father, is there? Well, no, no. Oh, oh heavens, I... Yes, Madame. I, I'm so sorry. I, I'm afraid I feel one of my headaches. Oh, Madame, I'm I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to stay more than a minute, if, if you'll excuse me. Certainly. And you will come again, won't you? Yes, Monsieur de Rastignac. 
We shall be desolate if you do not come again. Marcel will show you to the door. It isn't necessary. Goodbye. 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 Marcel, neither your mistress nor I are at home to that gentleman when he calls. There you are. Mr. Gorio is the father of a countess. So you heard where the count threw the door, eh? Telling the servant not to let you in again? Yes, but that doesn't worry me with my connection. All the I... same. You mustn't go around rattling the skeletons in other people's closets. But one's father... Bah! Said... Shocked are you that they're ashamed of the old fogey? You are still a child, Rostenyuk. Look here. I can give you some advice. You are determined to succeed? Then be hard. The more cold-blooded your calculations, the further you will go. Strike ruthlessly. You will be feared. Men and women for you must be post horses. Take a fresh relay and leave the last to drop by the roadside. But men and women aren't post horses. Well, they'd better be if you want to reach the goal of your ambition. I know. If you have a heart, lock it carefully away like a treasure. Don't let anyone suspect it or you're lost. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, wait, my boy. Wait and see. You're too soft now. Yeah, now, here comes Bianchon, our fledgling sawbones. Take a look at him. Did I hear my name taken in vain? Not in vain, but as an illustration. I'm trying to convince Rostinek that he's too soft, too sentimental. In my profession, there is no room for sentimentality. If a withered limb must be cut off so that a man may live, then we cut it off. Mm, perhaps old Gorio is the withered limb that keeps his daughters from living as they should. As you want, you mean. But all this is ridiculous. Do you can... think so? I suppose you are going to the ball at the Italian tonight? With my cousin? The, the Vicomtesse de Bosson? I know. Well, Gorio's other daughter is bound to be there. Take a good look at her. Study her. And you'll see how hard you must be if you're going to conquer this corrupt world we call society. You mean the one in red, dear cousin? No, no. The one in blue. The one with the light blonde hair. See, she's glancing our way now. So that's Gorio's other daughter. She's charming. She has white eyelashes. Yes, but she has such a pretty slender figure. And her hands are large. Such beautiful eyes. Her face is long. Yes, but Link gives distinction. It's lucky for her she has some distinction in her face. Just see how she fidgets with her fan. Her Gorio blood shows itself in every movement. Uh, what did you say her name was? She's the Baroness de Nuit saint jean Now... But she was plain Delphine Gorio. Oh, never plain, cousin. I believe you're losing your heart to her, Eugene. Don't do that. She'll devour it and look about for another. There, she's glancing at us again. I'll smile and bow. And then you can go and ask her to dance with you. Oh, she's laughing. What lovely tea. Oh, Eugene, what a moth you are. Well, go to your flame. Madame de Duc Saint Jean? What? Yes. Ah, you're the young man who is sitting in the Vicomtesse de Bersant's bar. I'm a cousin, Eugene de Rastignac. Really? How do you do? Madame, if you would care to dance. Monsieur, I love to dance. you are, like a feather. Really? There are so many other dancers better than I am here. I wonder you sought me out. Madame, I will be honest and confide a secret in you. I'm your father's neighbor. Oh. Perhaps you can help me. I had no idea that Madame de Restaud was his daughter, and I was rash enough to mention his name. I meant no harm, but I'm afraid I annoyed your sister <laughs> and her husband very much. Anastasie is rather heartless at times. Between you and me... My cousin, the Vicomtesse, made some comparison between you and your sister, speaking in high terms of you and saying how fond you were of my neighbor, Monsieur Garot. Did she? How oh, very nice. Really, I think that you and I are going to be great friends. Although friendship with you could not be like an ordinary friendship, I should never wish to be your friend. Monsieur? 
You've been reading novels. Yes, it is very wrong of my sister to treat our poor father as she does. He's been a providence to us. Such a good man. You must see him often. Well, it was not until Monsieur de Saint jean positively ordered me only to receive him in the mornings that I yielded to the point. Oh? But I've been unhappy about it for a long time. I've shed many tears over I can it. understand that. This violence to my feelings, my husband's brutal treatment, they've made my married life an unhappy one, monsieur. Oh, madame. Yes, it's true. You think that I must be out of my senses to talk to you like this. But you know my father, and I can't regard you as a stranger. You'll find no one who longs as eagerly as I do to be your confidant. Oh, thank you, Eugene. Then... Uh, Perhaps you will come and see your father tomorrow morning. Well, I shall be at my dressmaker's until noon. Then in the afternoon. Oh, it's impossible, I'm afraid. I must ride in the bois. Oh, but soon. Yes, soon. How lovely this music is. It awakens sadness in me. Are you ever sad, monsieur? Eugene. Oh, so often. That's the food of a young man, to be sad to be unhappy, to be in love. Ah, yes, to be in love. To be in... Uh, oh, but there's your sister, the Comtesse de Restaux. Where? Oh, what an ugly dress. Shall we go over and make your peace with her? If you like. Very well. Oh, but take my advice. Don't mention our poor father. Monsieur Eugene. Oh, oh. Why, Papa Gorio? What are you doing up so late? It must be after four o'clock. Uh, I don't sleep so well now. Uh, besides, I, I heard that you were going to the ball at the Italian. Uh, were they there? They? Oh, your daughters. Yes, they were, both of them. Uh, uh, will you step into my room for a moment? Well, I'm, I'm rather tired, but... Well, good Lord. Haven't you anything but a bed in that wretched chair? What else does an old man need? Uh, but uh, look on the shelf there. Huh? Why, silver forks and spoons. Why, they're beautiful. They're antiques. Did you... My wife gave those to me on our wedding day nearly 40 years ago. Oh, they're lovely. Every time I look at them, I think of her. And the good old days come back. Uh, but I didn't bring you here to look at my silver. Did you speak to my daughters at the ball? I spoke to both of them. Ah, oh, yes. How lucky you were. And which one do you like the best? Why, I like Madame Delphine the best. Because she loves you the best. Well, thank you, thank you. What she, did she say about me? Well, uh, she... Uh, yes? She inquired about your health. Did she? The dear child. Ye yes, she is very fond of me. Uh, and Anastasie is very fond of me, too. Yes, but... Uh... Monsieur Gariot, how is it your daughters have such fine houses while you live in such a den as this? Dear me, why should I want anything better? My real life is in my two girls, you see. I shall never feel cold as long as they are warm. I shall never feel dull if they are laughing. I have no trouble but theirs. I believe you. I, I live in my daughters. Everywhere I hear their voices sounding in my ears. I see. Oh, but what nonsense I've been talking, monsieur... It's cold. You ought not to stay here. But tell me once more what message my daughter sent to me. Well, she told me to tell you that your daughter sends you a good kiss. Ah. Oh. Uh, good night, neighbor. Sleep well and pleasant dreams to you. I have mine already made for me by that message from her. Good night, Papa Gorio. Poor old fellow. His daughters had no more concern for him than for the Grand Turk. Uh, come in. Who is it? Oh, it's you, Bianchon. Yes, the medical cut-up. I came in to feel your pulse. You've been out every night this week, and here it is nearly noon, and still you lurk in this musty chamber. 
Give me your wrist. My pulse is all right. It's my purse that needs treatment. <laughs> I don't wonder. Carriages and evening clothes, bouquets and pâté de foie well, gras. Spare me the pâté. I abhor it. Eugene. Yes? I dropped in to tell you that Papa Goriot is entertaining an extremely handsome woman in his dirty little chamber. What? It must be his daughter Delphine. She hath promised it. His door was ajar, and I, I couldn't avoid hearing a few words. They're talking about money. Oh, the poor old boy. Open the door slightly, Bianchon. I have no shame in eavesdropping, and what we learn may aid him. Quiet, then. God forgive you, child, but this is a staggering blow. You, you can't know how much I love you, or you wouldn't have burst in on me like this with such news. Does one think what one's doing after a catastrophe? Delphine, I just don't understand. It's simple enough. My husband has invested all his capital and mine in business speculations. <laughs> At least that's what he calls them. If I made him refund my dowry now, it would bankrupt Do him. you really believe that silly rubbish? I must. There's nothing I can do. If I try to get my money back, he's just the man to abscond with everything and leave me in the lurch. Why, well, then the fellow's a crook. Of course he's a crook. I wanted to keep it from you to spare your feelings. I didn't want you to know that you had married me to such a man. But there is such a thing as the law. Oh, no, Father, the law can't Great touch him. Heavens, what have I done to you? Bound my daughter to a scoundrel. Oh, my child, forgive me, forgive me. There's I... nothing to forgive. I'm at my wit's end, that's all. The bills pile up so, and I... Shh. There's someone coming up the stairs. Someone? What? It's honest as see. What on earth? Father, I... Oh, Delphine. What, is there so extraordinary in my being here? I see our father every day. Well, since when? If you came yourself, you might know. Children, children. Don't tease, Delphine. I'm very miserable. I'm lost. Oh, my poor father, it's hopeless this time. What is it, Anastasi? Oh, wait, you are. Tell us about it, child. Well, then, my, my husband knows everything. Everything? Do you remember, father, that bill of Maxime's some time ago? Well, that was not the first. I, I'd paid ever so many before that. Well? Well, now there's another one. How much? A hundred thousand francs. Good heaven! Father, I... I found the money by selling what was not mine to sell. Go on. I, I shall always love you and never judge you, honest to see. Well, I, I took all the family diamonds that my husband is so proud of and... Sold them, Anastasia? Sold them. Oh, my poor daughter. Yesterday, my husband came to me and asked me where they were. In my room, I started to say, no, he shouted, they're in my pocket. And he drew them out and showed them to me. Do you want me to tell you where I found them, he demanded? Father, I fell on my knees and besought him to tell me the death he wished me to die. You said that? By heaven, whoever lays a hand on either of you so long as I'm alive may reckon on being roasted by slow fire. Oh, now he's ordered me to make over all my property to him. Oh, he'll disgrace me in public. Do nothing of the kind. I will bring Risto to terms. The monster... Father, help me. I need 12,000 francs. Yes, and Father, I need 6,000. Honest to I... see, Delphine, I haven't the money. I have nothing. Nothing? Not a sou. But... What became of your government savings yes, and your annuity? I sold out. Kept only a trifle for myself, and that, too, is gone. Into Anastasie's pocket, I suppose. Thank you, Delphine. You never did love oh, me. Oh, yes. Yes, she loves you, Anastasie. She was saying so only just now. We were talking about you, and she insisted that you were beautiful and that she herself was only pretty. Pretty? Why, she's as hard as a marble statue. Please, Anastasie. Delphine, you are nothing to me any longer. I detest you. Never mind her, Father. She's mad just now. Mad, am I? And what are you? Children, children, or I shall die if you go on like this. You're killing me. Goodbye, Father. Help! Help! My father! Oh, he's fainted. Help! Father! Father, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing. It, it will go off. There, there is something heavy pressing on my forehead... A, li a little headache. Oh, poor Anastasia. What a life lies before her. There, there now. Be quiet and try to rest. Madame, if you will be... Oh, so... I'm going. I was just about to go anyway. Oh, Eugene? Yes? I'll see you at the ball tonight. And you'll tell me how my father is. Good morning, gentlemen. Hmm. At the ball. Well, well... I was going to suggest that she spend a little time at her father's bedside. I don't like the looks of his face. Is there anything I can do? 
No, Eugene, go to your law studies for a change, and then go to the ball. There must be people dancing, or what's society for? The old man is dreadfully ill. Oh, too bad. How was the ball? Brilliant and boring. What's wrong with him? Well, he's practically finished, or I'm much mistaken. Apoplexy, I think. Apoplexy? Isn't there a cure? No. Is he awake? Let me speak to him. Papa. Papa Corio. Good uh, evening. Uh, what? What? How is she? She... Oh, you mean Delphine. She's all right, but how are you? There's there's nothing the matter with me, dear boy. Don't tire him. Eugene, I want a word with you. Come over here. What is it? Nothing but a miracle can save him. Eugene, the other one has been here again. Anastasia? Yes, this afternoon. And afterward, the old man got up and went out. Well, leave him to me for a little while. I'll make him confess. Papa... Papa Gorio. Yes, my boy. Did Anastasie come to see you again? Oh, yes. My dear Anastasie. What did she want? Oh, she was very miserable. Since that affair of the diamond, she hasn't a sou of her own. Well? The poor girl, she's ordered a golden gown for the ball. But the dressmaker wouldn't give it to her unless she paid down a thousand francs. So? So I went to the pawnbroker. Sold my silver, my forks and spoons. You see the shelf? It's empty. But under the pillow, I have a thousand franc note. Oh, Papa Gorio. It warms me to have it lying under my head. Honest to see is coming for it tomorrow. I see. We'll try to sleep now, Papa Gorio. Bianchon? What is it, Eugene? Go ahead. Get some rest. I'll watch for the rest of the night. Did did they enjoy themselves? Good morning, Bichon. Oh, he thinks of nothing but his daughters. Mm-hmm. Scores of times before dawn, he said to me, they're dancing now. He called them by their names. He made me cry, devil take it, calling with that tone in his voice for Delphine, my little Delphine, and Anastasie. Upon my word, it was enough to make anyone cry. Poor old boy. I'm going down now to tell Madame Vauquet to get the poultices ready. You ought to go on at once. Very well. I'll stay for a while. I'm not tired at all. Uh, dear boy, is that you? Do you feel any better, Papa Gorio? Yes. My head felt as though it were being screwed in a vice, but... Now it is set free again. Did you see my girls? They, they will be here directly. As soon as they know that I'm ill, they'll hurry here at once. Yes, yes. They'll come Try before to long. I, I, I know them so well, my... Tender-hearted Delphine. If I am going to die, she will feel it so much. And so will Anastasie. I... I do not want to die. They will cry if I die. And if I die, dear Eugene, I, I shall not see them anymore. Oh, what can I oh, say? Oh, the... The pains again. Something... Something is crushing my head. I, I, I want my daughters. Quick! Quick! I, I must have my daughters. For heaven's sakes, be quiet. Your heart pain, won't... The pain grows worse and worse... Oh, to see them, to, to touch their dresses. Oh, nothing but their dresses. That is very little. Still to feel something that belongs to them. Let me touch their hair with my fingers. Their hair with my fingers. Thank God you're back, Bianchon. He shall have his daughters. I'm going to fetch them myself. What is it? Monsieur de Risteau, your father-in-law, Monsieur Gorio, is lying at the point of death in a squalid den in the Latin Quarter. He's not a sou to pay for firewood. He's expected to die any moment, and he keeps calling for his daughter. I feel very little affection for Monsieur Gorio. His character has been compromised in connection with Madame Risteau, 
He's the author of the misfortunes that have embittered my life and troubled my peace of mind. It is a matter of perfect indifference to me whether he lives or dies. Monsieur le Comte, it's no business of mine to criticize your conduct. But promise me one thing, that you will tell your wife that her father has not 24 hours to live. And he calls constantly for her. You can tell her yourself. Here she is. Madame. I heard all that you said, monsieur. Tell my father that if he knew all, he'd forgive me. I, I can't come, for it's against my husband's wishes. But, madame... Good day, monsieur. But, my dear Eugene, I'm ill. I caught cold after the ball, and I'm afraid of pneumonia. I'm waiting for the doctor now. If you were at death's door, you must be carried somehow to your father. He's calling for you. Eugene, I dare say my father's not quite so ill as you say. But, well, I will go as soon as I've seen the doctor. I shall count on you, madame. Back so soon, Eugene. Well, are they coming? I think Delphine will come. Is there any hope? Can he speak? He's been talking about his daughters all the time. He calls for them as a man impaled calls Honest for water. Honest to see. Honest to see. Delphine. There is life in him yet. Good Lord, why must he go on living? Honest to, to suffer. See. Delphine. Oh, my angels. <sighs> well, I was afraid of this. He will lie like this for a short time and die so quietly that we shan't know when he goes. She's come too late. It is not Delphine. It is a Comtesse de Restaud. Oh, I could not escape soon enough. So I see. Oh, forgive me, Father. You used to say my voice could call you back from the grave. Oh, come back for one moment to bless your penitent daughter. Do you hear me? No one on earth will ever bless me again. Everyone hates me. No one loves me but you and all the world. My own children will hate me. Take me with you, Father. I love you. I'll take care of you. He, he doesn't hear me. Madame. You... Why doesn't he move? Oh, oh, my God. Is he? Yes, he is dead. Oh. <laughs> what a strange look you have on your face, Eugene. What are you thinking? I'm thinking of another world. A world of luxury, of mansions, of shining carriages. A world of false and greed. A world between the Place Vendôme and the Envelise. From now on, there's war between us. Gorio by Honoré de Balzac is another in a series of living fiction presented each week by Northwestern University in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company. Adapted for radio by Herbert Gorman. The cast and directors were students of Northwestern University. Per Gorio was played by Ansel Ressler. Eugene by Tam Spiva. Anastasie by Millette Alexander. Delphine by Nancy Cafestio. Dr. Bianchon by Toby Carlson. Beautran by Bob Tack. Madame Beaucaire by Vivian Newberg. Resto by Peter Goodman, and the Vicomtesse by Susan Heinrich. The assistant director was Lincoln Bumble. The director was Dick Reeves. The entire production was under the supervision of John Cowan. This is Hugh Downs speaking. This is the NBC Radio Network.